How do you edit infrared images using Canon Digital Photo Professional RAW Editor? Let's walk through it. Are you interested in learning more about infrared photography? Check out my book. Details are at the end of this video. Digital Photo Professional 4 is an image editor that can process RAW files from Canon cameras. It is available for free. DPP is available on Mac and Windows for the desktop. Digital Photo Professional Express is also available on the iPad. It allows for direct importing via the Canon Camera Connect app. However, the Express version has a $1 per month subscription. Let's walk through the process for editing an infrared image in DPP. So if I double click on this raw image, then I'll be able to open it up within the raw editor. So we have a navigator, we have a histogram, then over on the right side here, we have a tool palette. The first thing that I want to do is make sure that I'm working in a good color space. Most of the images that I shoot are captured in Adobe RGB. I want to make sure I'm viewing that color space while editing in Adobe RGB. If I output, I might output into a smaller color space, but I want to make sure I'm seeing my color in the full color space. So here under this basic panel with the gear, I can select the working space that I want, and I'm going to select Adobe RGB. The next thing that I'm going to do is go over to the basic tab. So that's this one that looks like a gradient over here. And I want to be able to set a white balance. So there's a number of options that are available here in a white balance presets that you've probably seen in other programs. And most of these are not going to be helpful for infrared. You're going to want to set a custom white balance. And we'll do that using the white balance adjustment picker. So I'll select the picker and then I will select a location on the image that is neutral. So clouds or pavement, something along those lines. I'll select clouds here. I've got some nice clouds and you can see that that will immediately give me a pretty good white balance for infrared. I have lovely blue here in the foreground with the tree, maybe a little bit of blue in the shadows here, but I've got a nice gold color in the sky. My clouds are white. And so by and large, the neutrals are neutral. One of the challenges here is that if I wanted to fine tune this a little bit, I don't really have the option to do that. I don't have a temperature slider that I can adjust. If I go down into the fine tuning section, then, and I try to make an adjustment, then immediately making an adjustment takes me out of that custom selection that I've made. Looking at the various ranges that you would have, it's difficult to get back to what I was looking at with the custom settings. And so fine tuning is not so good. You're pretty much limited to using the color picker, selecting your color, and then that's what you get. One of the nice things you could do is use this register option. So I could take the white balance that I have, I could select one of the presets that are available and I could save it. And then this would allow me to recover that white balance for another image. So if you had a series of images that use the same white balance, then you could save it in, in one of these three register settings and then repeat it. We know fine tuning doesn't work. Let's, let's work down this panel here. Picture style gives us a variety of options that are similar to the presets that you might see within a camera. So auto, we have standard, we have portrait, and I'll zoom back out here so we can see what the, each one of these look like. So the kind, of, the kind of things you would expect to see from your Canon camera, for example, uh, landscape is going to be more saturated. So you can pick a look that you'd like, including monochrome, to decide what the style of your image is. I'll go with standard for this example. Next, I can come down to the gamma adjustment area. And I actually think that the auto gamma adjustment here in DPP does a pretty good job of setting your levels. And so I can click auto, there'll be a little bit of time to process, and then it will set my levels. And then I'll get a nice gradation of tones in my image. I could also come down to the advanced section and I could make adjustments for contrast to increase contrast, to adjust the shadows, brighten the shadows. I could adjust highlights if I needed to make any adjustments there. I could adjust the amount of color and saturation. I could also do some sharpening. So for the sake of this discussion, let me actually just reset these to zero, but know that you do have these options available to be able to uh, alter your image in this way. So next up, let's talk about the color adjustments that are available. Up here, we'll go to the color tab and this will bring our color adjustments. So for here, I can adjust the hue of the image which would give me a little bit of leeway in what the hue looks like. Also, I can reset this back to zero and I can also adjust the saturation. So I could desaturate the image or I could increase the saturation of the image. 
uh, what, whatever I would prefer there. Also, I can adjust the sort of HSL settings, the hue, saturation, and luminance for a variety of individual channels. This can be useful if you wanted to reduce the color saturation of the foliage to be white. You could come down to the blue channel and you could reduce that saturation. That gets you part of the way there. Maybe you've got to do a little bit of aqua and purple to get all the way there. Uh, looks like just aqua was enough. If I was to process this image and do a color swap, I could get a blue sky, but then all of the foliage would be white. Also from this panel, you can do a monochrome adjustment. So I can click this button to basically desaturate all of the channels and produce a monochrome image. I'll hit the reset button here to reset all of the saturations back to normal. Speaking of color swapping, this is one of the negatives of Canon DPP is that there is no capability to do color swapping within the program. So there's no channel mixer, there's no invert options. You will need to save the image that you create here. Once you have set a white balance, you'll need to export your image either as a TIFF or a JPEG and then do any color swapping that you'd like to do in another program. So preferably if you were doing that, you would save it as a TIFF. So let's talk about what we would do next uh, as a part of the workflow with this program. So if we go up to the edit menu, we can select convert and save. I can select the type that I want to save as, and the drop down here will show me that I can save this as a JPEG. JPEG would be if you're done editing and you want to save to social media or another source, you could save as a JPEG. I could save to an 8-bit TIFF, a 16-bit TIFF, or I could do both save to both a TIFF and a JPEG at the same time. If you're planning to edit in another program, I would recommend selecting the 16-bit TIFF and then hitting save, and then that will save a TIFF image which you could open in, say, Photoshop or any other program to do a color swap or additional editing. DPP does have a batch editing process, so if we go to File, and select batch process, we could batch process a variety of images and save them as a TIFF, for example. But unfortunately, you don't have the ability to set a white balance when doing this, not even one of the preset registered white balances. So this kind of limits the ability of this batch process to be able to quickly set a white balance on all of the images in a shoot and then export them as TIFFs to then be edited in another program. So you may be wondering if there's a lot of extra work here, why would I go to the trouble of using DPP? And probably the main reason is image quality. So let's take a look at comparing the image quality between a TIFF exported from DPP and a raw file that is being processed directly in Lightroom. So here I have an example of those. On the left, I have the TIFF file that was created in Canon's DPP. And on the right, I'm viewing a raw file. In both of these images, I have saved a white balance using the same technique by white balancing on the clouds. In the TIFF from DPP, of course, I've set the gamma, but then in the image from Lightroom, I've made no other adjustments. Now, immediately you can see there is a slight difference in color. The left image from DPP, the blue is a little bit richer, a little bit bluer, if you will, whereas the color that is being rendered by Lightroom is a little bit more teal. Now this could be from a difference in white balance or it could just be the, the color rendering between the two. Let's zoom in a little bit and look at some of the image detail. So if I zoom in to 100%, and of course you'll get similar rendering from Adobe Camera Raw if you were to open this raw file directly in Photoshop. So when I look at 100%, the differences that I'm seeing are based on the color differences, maybe a little bit of differences in the shadow detail, but that could be accounted for by the gamma. Because it might be hard to see some of these details, let's zoom in a little bit more. So I'm going to go into 200%. As I get into 200%, one of the things that I'm starting to see is the way that highlights are handled. The image from DPP handles highlights a little bit better. The image from Lightroom has the highlights blown out a little bit. If I switch over to the develop module for the Lightroom image, I can take the highlights and drag those down all the way. And you'll see that I'll recover a little bit of the highlights. They don't quite look so blown out, but I've had to go all the way to negative 100 to get that look. So now if I switch back to the comparison view, you can see that the highlights are a little bit closer between the two of them. But let's get a little crazy and zoom in a little bit more now. 400% is not the kind of zooming you would normally do in an image. I'm certainly not pixel peeping to that level, 
But I think it's interesting in this example because it does show one of the key differences that we see between these two programs. So if we look at the image on the right, which is Lightroom's rendering, you'll start to see some artifacting, some worming, if you will, happening in the sky. Whereas the image that's produced by DPP is much cleaner in the sky with much less noise. So you'll see that you're going to get better rendering of these flatter areas from DPP than you would from Lightroom. Now, will you see this in your day-to-day -day activity? Probably not. If you're shooting for social media or small printing, then you're probably not going to notice this difference. But if you were making a large print, then maybe this is something that you would want to be aware of. If I look at the edges in these, I can see that I've got these really sharp edges over here in the DPP image, almost dark edges that here, but I have a little bit more uh, lighter control of the edges. So DPP image on the left seems to do a better job with the sky. The Lightroom image seems to do a little bit better job with edges. So something to keep in mind, it may have an impact on what type of image you're looking at as to which program you would prefer. Let's go back to the develop module and look at the image that is rendered in Lightroom. If I look at the sharpening options that are available, down in detail, you can see that we have a default level of sharpening at 40. So I could reduce the amount of worms, if you will, or artifacts by either, by reducing the sharpening overall. But you'll notice if you look at the trees that that also reduces the overall sharpness of the image. So that's not so great either. Another option that I have in Lightroom is to be able to hold down the Alt key and then drag the mask and decide what I want to apply the sharpening to. So in this case, I want to apply it to the tree only and not so much to the sky. And that would allow me to retain some of the sharpness in the trees, but reduce some of the artifacting that happens in the sky. You can improve from the default settings that are available in Lightroom, but you'll have to make some adjustments to sharpening in order to do so. So let's talk about some of the pros and cons of using Canon DPP. DPP is great for rendering Canon files. The gamma, the color, the sharpening all look great at the defaults without a lot of extra work there. You can set a good white balance for infrared, and this program is free, at least in the desktop versions. Let's talk about some of the cons. The workflow is going to be a little bit slower than, say, a Lightroom-only workflow. You won't have as much control over the color temperature that you would in other programs. You still have the picker, but you don't have any option to make fine-tune controls as you would in other programs. You would have to export your image as a TIFF and then make any fine-tuned adjustments in a temp and tint adjustment without being able to change the the color temperature. Remember, once you've exported as a TIFF, the color temperature is baked in and you no longer get the Kelvin controls that you would before that point. There are no color swapping options in DPP, so you cannot do a full edit or a full workflow here unless you're doing a version that is monochrome or doesn't involve any sort of color swapping. The batch processing is unfortunately limited and the Express version has a monthly subscription, which just doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of this ecosystem. So in summary, should you use DPP as your daily editor? The image quality benefits may not be noticeable for social media and for small prints. If you were to make large prints and you wanted the absolute best quality available, then definitely using DPP and exporting as a TIFF could be a great way to get your image started. Do you use Canon DPP in your workflow? What do you like about it? Let us know in the comments. If you'd like to learn more about infrared photography, check out my book, Color Doesn't Exist, a practical guide to infrared photography. It's full of details for photographers at all skill levels. Now available in print and ebook editions. Check it out at infraredbook.com. If you find these videos helpful on your infrared photography journey, like, subscribe, or comment. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.